Good morning! We got a blue sky day today. It's day number 12 of harvest, day number two of corn harvest. And just look at that. We're going to be hopping into the intercrop plot today. We got 27 acres of this to try, so we're going to be seeing what row configuration does best. 12 and 12, 6 and 6, 8 and 8, 4 and 4, 3 and 3, 2 and 2. Are we over there? One and one. 12 and 12, six and six, two and two, the inter... What? This is intercropping. Intercropping is when we plant different crops side by side. So in this case, I have soybeans planted next to corn. Most fields in the world, including most of the fields on my farm, look like this. This is called monocropping. I was told that intercropping is the most profitable method of farming corn in the world. Who told me this? Well... <laughs> Uh, old McDonald? Why, of course! What's that smell? <laughs> I don't smell anything! <clears throat> uh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Uh, nine, one... Wait a second. Hmm. What do we got here? Tractor keys. Ah, $10,000. Ah, photos of Mrs. McDonald. Donald. <laughs> ah, here we are. Intercropping is the most profitable form of farming in the world. Shh. So I decided to test it out for myself. I took 55 acres of my best land and I planted seven different row configurations of corn and soybeans. I have 12 rows of corn, 12 rows of beans, six rows of corn, six rows of beans, eight and eight, four and four, three and three, two and two, and one and one. The soybeans were planted at a population of 110,000 plants per acre and each row of corn was planted at a different population. The outside row that touches the beans was planted at 52,000 plants per acre. The second row was at 44,000 plants per acre. The third row contained 36,000 and everything else inside of that was at 32,000. The idea behind intercropping being so successful is due to two things. Sunlight and temperature. The more sunlight a plant gets, the better it does. The cooler a plant can get, especially at night, the better it does. In a monocrop situation, the only plants that receive sunlight all day are the rows on the outside edge of the field. Every other plant in the field only gets full sunlight on the top 25% of the plant. In an intercrop field, we create almost an unlimited amount of outside row opportunities. So now we have more rows getting more sunlight and we have more plants in more rows getting more sunlight. The other benefit to more outside rows is the fact that the warm air that is trapped between the rows only must move a few feet to escape from the crop canopy. This can help plants in an intercrop situation cool down much more versus plants in a monocrop situation. It is said that for every one degree increase in nighttime temperature, three bushels or $15 an acre is lost. And so I guess the million dollar question is, is all of this going to work? My common sense says it should. My advisors say it should. Science says it should, but I really don't know. So here we are giving it a try to see for ourselves. Last night we got the grain cart full, we got the red Volvo full, and then around the corner, we got the gray Freightliner full. So we're gonna try to get that bin with just a little bit of grain in the bottom. We can't do a lot because the foundation under it is ruined. So we're gonna do like 500 bushels in it at a time. And we're gonna try to get the dryer running. We tossed a little grain in the bottom of this. We're just bringing it right up this auger, up the leg, and we're bringing it right over top into the semi again. Just so there's a little crud down there. We're just kind of circulating it in. We don't need to repeat it last night where a big chunk of crap fell down in the bottom of there. And I had to climb in and then poke it out. Something's going on up there. Cooper is gonna try to take that cover off, get to the belts on the inside, see if he can turn them. Somehow this auger plugged in like six seconds. How'd that get in there? <laughs> that could have been a factor. If some birds got back in there, turned it on, got wrapped up and stuff. <laughs> Try it again. It's like what happened that one time when we had that, the old pit, and he hooked it up for 480 when it was supposed to be 220, and then there's just no power to the motor. The other day when we fixed those wires inside the box, yeah. I wonder if one of those didn't get homed all the way in, and it's only halfway in there, so it's not getting the full juice to it. It just makes me wonder if one of those isn't fully seated in there the way it's supposed to be. 
It's just not touching right. The plan was we were going to get that dryer filled up and we were going to go eat breakfast while that stuff was flowing through there. So then we kind of would get that thing just shined up, run it a little slower while we were eating. But we called Wade, the electrician. It sounds like he thinks anyway that a phase is off. So a wire is loose somewhere. So he's on his way out to come look at it. I'm gonna go eat breakfast. Breakfast. I should have ate breakfast earlier. It sounds like they've been having problems. I guess Wade came out and looked at this and during that time, they've already blown this many fuses. And we have that many left that are still good in case we blow more. And we blow two at a time when they go. Before, when I was out here, we weren't blowing fuses. And then now we think there may be a chunk of junk stuck up inside this auger that's plugging it. So Cooper is up top with a big old pipe wrench and he's turning that pulley slowly backwards and then bringing the grain down to the bottom where Ricardo is just gonna use the vacuum, suck it out a vacuum bin at a time, we'll dump it in the skin loader, then we'll take that and we'll dump that back in the pit. There's more grain inside that auger than a guy thinks. This is skin loader bucket number one. Dump it right into the pit. Oh, that sounds like running auger. I think I just opened it too far earlier and then it over amped the motor. And then instead of blowing a fuse, it just stopped it, which is weird. But then after it stopped, then it started blowing fuses every time after that. It's honestly really hard to say. Sometimes you can just guess. Corn's going down into the pit, coming up this black auger, going in this leg, all the way up to the top. It's coming down that down spout over into this bin. This is the bottom of this bin, going up the auger into the dryer. The dryer will dry it. It'll drop down into this conveyor. This conveyor takes it up the other leg. The other leg will take it on the conveyors that go above the bins and we can put it in that bin or we can put it in that bin. But before we can start dropping anything up there, we're getting the dryer filled with grain. It takes about a semi load to fill it. And then we'll be able to get the temperature adjusted so we get this drying to the right spot and then we'll start putting it in the big bin. Good news is we got everything over there running in manual mode, but when we try to go into automatic mode like this, then it just does that. The unload in this pit is supposed to be rated for 8,000 bushels an hour. Now that's at 15% corn and we're running like 21%, so we don't expect that much, but we're able to open up about that far, so we're running probably like maybe 2,000 bushels an hour right now. It's about all we can do, otherwise we burn the belts off. So, pit is not <laughs> working up to <laughs> even really close to what it's supposed to. What would that be, like 25% of what it's supposed to run is what it's running at. And if we put any more in it, then we burn the belts off because it plugs the auger. And then we have a not so fun time with a three foot long pipe wrench and a vacuum cleaner and then we get our two skid loader buckets of corn out of the bottom of it and i also forgot to mention that the way the bottom of that pit is designed you can't close the slide gate down fully so you can never actually shut the flow of grain going into the flighting off it's always open by about six inches even when you have it cranked down all the way so if you plug it and you're up there with the pipe wrench cranking on it you'll never get the flighting empty. And to put it into perspective, 21% corn is, I mean, it's wet corn, but it's not like wet, wet corn. 28, 29, 30% corn, you can understand just trickling through something, because that's wet. But when, when you start getting close to 20, I, that's I'm starting to flow pretty good. I apologize for all the negativity around the Ben site stuff going on. I don't even like filming over here. It, it makes me feel sick, literally, like, I have a migraine from this right now. Just, I, I don't enjoy the complaining nature of filming stuff that is constantly broken and is a perpetual problem. So I'm, I'm just not really even gonna talk about it anymore. Everything here is involved in the lawsuit. So it's a matter of the lawsuit getting settled and figuring out what we're going to do from there. I mean, even like, the hopper bottom bin, us not being able to fix the foundation underneath of it, that's why we're just putting a little bit of grain in the bottom of it, because we know it's bad. But until we know what is going to go on with everything else, we can't really do something in the middle of the thing. And then if that needs to be moved or something done different around that, 
then we're basically doing it a third time. So we're kind of sitting on our hands right now. Everything on the electrical side, that is us. That's our people we hired and we're just trying to get bugs figured out. It's a lot of coding things with the automation. We expect stuff like that to happen until we get things ironed out. We've never really had things able to run 100% fully until last year and then we were running into problems with the unloading situation in the pit so we had to change up some automatic logic that's in the algorithm of the computer inside the dryer shack and I think that those changes are what's causing us to have problems not being able to fire up the dryer right now but as for everything around the pit and the rest of the system that's all on the lawsuit I can't really talk about it right now well they haven't told me not to talk about it I'm just gonna not because I don't want to be jumping to conclusions on things. I'd rather have a uh, a court document, the official expert reports, those kind of things that we're going off of versus what I think is. But I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's extremely common sense and you can look at things and be like, okay, yes, that is right or no, that is not right. And that is most of this. But that'll be coming at another day. But I, I just apologize for the the negativity around this, I guess. I, I don't like putting out negative stuff. There's enough negative things in the world and this isn't any of your guys' problems. So, nobody likes hearing about other people's problems. On a more positive note, the weather today, absolutely beautiful. It's like 55 degrees right now, almost no wind, beautiful sunlight, we got a blue sky. We cannot complain about this at all. Perfect harvest day. It's about two o'clock in the afternoon. We have not started the combine yet. Grain cart's still full. We got the red Volvo empty and Cooper, is emptying the gray freight liner. Well, we're waiting for Joe, the automation guy, to get here to look at what's going on with the dryer. Cooper's just getting this semi-empty. He's gonna bring it down to the main heated shop. He needs to pull this wheel off. This wheel seal's bad. Just underneath the separator on the combine, we have what's called a pre-sieve. I don't really know what it does other than it's like, it's the first part of the sieve. That's the upper sieve, the chaffer, chaffer sieve, and this is the pre-sieve. But I want it to be set where just a kernel of corn slides right between it, and I think that's what we got it at. Yesterday, when we were just getting this little area here picked, it seemed like we just had a little bit more corn on the ground than we would have liked. So we're gonna try to mess with some settings here, see if we figure out what's going on. You can only get it so good, but it just seemed like there was more than usual. We need to come up with some sort of code word for when stuff breaks on the bench site. That doesn't sound so negative. What can we say? The bench site just gave us a new gift. We'll do that. What are we doing here? Basically plugging into the OBD port so we can... <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> Joe got us fixed just as we suspected. It was something in the computer programming side of things. He didn't have certain logic in that needed to be there and therefore stuff did not turn on. But Joe came to the rescue. So now is the time we are going to get started on the intercrop plot. This is actually going to work perfect. Dad's going to be monkeying around with the dryer. Cooper's working on the semi. We have an empty grain cart. We have an empty semi. We're gonna have a little slower going on this intercrop plot because we're gonna be putting down a lot of the numbers of what's going on and just measuring a lot of things. So it's gonna be slower going. So this is actually gonna work perfect. Cooper did the control area of the farm last night. So this was just standard corn. Then we're gonna start with our 12 rows of corn, 12 rows of beans combination. We're gonna work our way down. As we go further down, they get smaller and smaller. I think the three rows of corn and the three rows of beans is going to be the best overall yield between the corn and between the beans. I think the corn is going to do 70 bushels better than the control. That's my guess right now. We should probably check the oil. Right in the middle, perfect. Green tank is empty. Look at the size of these kernels. Those things are huge. I'm gonna turn the machine on. I just let it run for about five minutes. So we got kind of some oil warmed up in the engine, but I'm gonna turn the head on. We get all the hydraulic oil and stuff running through everything, get that nice and warm, get all the gearbox oil warm. We're just gonna kind of take it easy here. Here we go. Right now we are combining six rows in the control. What I'm doing is we're gonna go all the way to the end and then we're gonna weigh what this six rows did. Then that way I can compare it to my six rows that I'm gonna be gathering over there. And I also have row configurations of three over there and I'm gonna be taking two of them at the same time. 
So that way I'm basically trying to compare apples to apples to the control. What is six rows doing? And I'm gonna be taking six rows in most of these passes outside of the 12 and the eight row configurations. So this is basically, we're going to go off a function of weight just in case the yield monitor is being a little funky here. But the spot we're in right now in the control on these six rows is doing 250 bushels to the acre. We just got our six rows of the control off. We have 2,000 foot long rows. So we're just about a half a mile here. And every single replication of rows that we're gonna have here, I have a down and back of each, and then they're both 2,000 feet long. So we're not doing just a 200 foot sample here. We're actually getting a nice representation going from one side of the field all the way to the other. We got 300 pounds on the grain cart right now. We are going to be using the scale on the grain cart as kind of our measuring reference, just in case something goes wonky on the monitor, because if something is gonna go wonky, it's usually when you're trying to test something. So this is gonna be back up, and then that is going to be our primary source of measuring. So let's fill her up and see what the control does. Those are some big kernels. Looks like we had 12,560 pounds. So 12,000, take 300 off that. Okay, we got the control 12 rows done on the side. It weighed 40 pounds shy of 26. Thousand. So now we're going to harvest this whole one across these 12 rows right here. We're going to see what they do. So it should be more than 26,000 pounds. If it is, then this did better. The only thing that I'm going to run into is I was picking six rows at a time and I was full by the time I got to the other end. So I'm going to get full when I'm halfway through this 12 rows. So I guess here it goes. It looks like we got a little bit of sprayer track right there. So our yield's going to get dinged right off the bat, but It'll average out. This is why we have long rows. I forgot to mention, the head is going down obnoxiously slow right now. We are missing a wire harness going from the head to the combine, so we're not getting the readings that we should. I can also go only about four miles an hour right now, because without that wire, I can't adjust my head speed faster, so it's not taking the grain away fast enough. We're not shooting the stock straight down fast enough. Yeah, it's got kind of a nice peak to it. If this was 15% corn, this would almost be level up here. And if this was 30% corn, the peak would be like all the way up to there. The 12 rows of beans and 12 rows of corn is pretty easy because here we were able to just go right down, get the 12 rows of corn, and then we didn't hit these beans at all. We were able to make our spreader so it wasn't spreading into the beans to be hitting this with a bunch of chaff. So now we'll just have to come back, put the bean head on, and we'll be able to combine these beans. Only problem I'm running into here is I'm not able to drive all the way to the end without getting full, which is a good problem to have. But that means I also have to drive through the beans over to the area where the grain car can pull beside me. See what kind of job we're doing on the ground. Oh, wow. These stalks are still green. <laughs> There's an incredible amount of moisture in that. If we take an area that's a square foot, we should not find more than two kernels. So we got one right there. We got one right there. I don't even like finding two. In my opinion, we should be able to find less than that. But for whatever reason, I can't seem to get it set that way. Sometimes that's just the conditions that you have. Concave set right, because we're sticking whole cobs out the back. We don't have any kernels of corn set to, so it's still stuck to it. We'll keep tinkering with it. I'm starting to just get a little bit of trash in the tank, so I know I got my sieves open enough. If I turn the fan down, then I start getting more trash in the tank, so I know I got that right where it needs to be. I might be doing all that I can. This is the last dump on the first 12 row pass. It appears we're about a thousand pounds more. 27,200. Oh, nothing but a little casual drive into the beans. We got the rows of 12 done. Now on to the sixes. I'm excited about these ones. Don't mind my little straggler piece right there. We're not gonna count that. It's working! I can see one of the challenges I'm running into right now and I knew I would have this. We have a 12 row head on, so we're sticking over into the beans beside us. And we have devastators. We have them pinned up right now, but they're still hitting those beans underneath right there. And they're definitely knocking some pods out. We're going about two and a half miles an hour right now, which definitely seems like it helps when I slow down, but we're still losing a fair amount of beans over there. We got the six and sixes done. Now we are on the eights and the eights. And so far it looks like the eights and the eights looking about 20 to 25 bushels less than what the six and the sixes were doing. Four and the four is definitely the most interesting one I've done so far. 
<laughs> we're straddling four rows of beans. My tracks are right on the edge of the corn. And <laughs> we're taking eight rows at a time. It's doing similar, if not consistently more average, higher. Did I say that right? It's consistently averaging higher than what the six and the six was. Just the six and the six, I got it to like 320 a few times across the field. Where on these four and fours, I've been at like 285 to 295 the entire time. Where the six and the six would sometimes get down to like 280. I think six and six might. This is why we're weighing it. We're gonna find out. On to the three and the three. It, spare track again. The three and three. Oh my goodness. <laughs> On the two and two, my track is riding right between those corn rows. So we're not running anything over there, but I am running over this bean row on this side, but it is doing well. And those yields, I probably need to get like 15 bushels per acre of soybeans in order for this to basically be the same as a monocrop situation for adding the corn and the beans together from a profit perspective. So if these beans do better than 15, then we made money. Basically every one bushel per acre better they do, we make an extra $12 an acre. I was doing some wonky head math in the cab, so let's break this down a little bit more simple. In order for us to figure out how much soybean yield we need, we need to understand what is going to be our break-even revenue per acre. So in order for us to understand that, let's look at the estimated cost of production of the corn and the soybeans. We are using estimated cost of productions right now because we are not done with harvest and we have not fully figured out the exact amount of inputs that have gone into the crop because breakdowns could happen, the diesel fuel expenditure, labor, all that still needs to be added in. So these were based off projections at the beginning of the year. So we're looking at a $1,100 per acre break-even price on the corn and a $950 per acre break-even price on the soybeans. So right now we're looking at a $5 corn market and a $12 soybean market. So basically 220 bushels per acre on corn will break even and 79 bushels per acre on soybeans will break even, which these are both about 20 bushels higher than what our averages typically are. And these prices right here are really high. Typically corn is about $750 an acre and soybeans would be a $450 per acre cost of production. But the prices that we're selling them for are also higher than normal because corn, $3.50 is pretty common and $9 soybeans. So basically what we're looking at is 22 and a half acres of corn and 22 and a half acres of beans planted on 45 acres. I know they're intertwined in the field, so it makes it look more confusing than it needs to be, but half the field is corn, half the field is beans. So simply what we're going to do is just say, okay, our cost of production of corn plus our cost of production of beans comes out to $2,050 an acre. Remember, the field is half and half, so we're just gonna add those two together. So we need to be at a total revenue of $2,050 per acre across the whole field in order to break even. We already know that we have 320 bushel corn in the area we are, and it's selling for five bucks. So we have $1,600 per acre of revenue off of our corn. But remember, we need 2,050. So what we're gonna do is just take our 2,050 that we need and then subtract the corn revenue off of it. So we need $450 per acre from the soybeans in order to break even. We're gonna sell them for 12 bucks, so we're simply just going to take the $450 divided by 12. We need 37.5 bushels per acre of soybeans with 320 bushel corn in order for us to break even at these prices. So I was a little off in my head in the field. I was trying to do some wonky stuff with multiplying by 50%, so I basically just accidentally have that number when I shouldn't have. So that's what we're looking at. And this is just for break even, which break even means we're making zero dollars. So if we want profitability, we need to be higher than these two combined here. We're not talking just flukes on the yield monitor either here. It's champion 58A21 as well, 108 day. I think it's about time for a snack. Last set of stuff, we're on the one and ones now. It's about nine o'clock, we're making some good headway. I got a down back, a down back, and then we'll be done with the intercrop plot, or at least the corn. And I'll have to come back later 
and get the soybeans. Now, apparently this plot is doing 410 bushels to the acre. Let's get out and take a look. I can't be the only one who wants to know what 400 bushel corn looks like because I have never seen this in my life. This is the absolute highest this farm has ever yielded in the history of planet Earth, or at least as long as humans have been able to record history of corn yields. This is the one-in-one -one configuration. So we have a row of corn, then we have a row of beans, and then we have a row of corn. So technically speaking, if this is yielding 400 bushels per acre right here, since we have half as much corn as we normally would, this is technically yielding 200 bushels per acre. And then whatever we get off the beans is bonus on top. Looking at these beans, they definitely got affected because they didn't get a lot of sunlight. So there's areas here where there's absolutely nothing. They are completely on the ground. Then there's spots where they're up. There's not a lot of pods on them, but even if these do 10 bushels to the acre, that's not too bad. Well, no, we want these to do 15 or better, which looking at this, I mean, they could. Due to the fact that these soybeans did not get a lot of sunlight because our row configuration is so narrow right here with the corn, I do not think the one in one is going to be the most profitable. Just solely due to the fact that the soybeans may not do 15, especially by the time the combine rolls over and goes through them because we have the devastators on underneath and those hang down a little bit. We got them tied up as much as we can, but you can only get them so high. And so the tops of the plants, these ones actually got hit with them. You can see some already broke open. And so those beans are gonna fall into the ground. We'll never get those. And then all the trash that's going up the back of the combine, that also kind of plasters them and knocks some open too. So if these do 15, great. But I think the, the, the money's probably more in the six by six or the three by three, maybe the four by four. I'll, I'll run the numbers together and we'll know for sure later, but this is doing 400, so <laughs> this definitely has the, the takes the cake when it comes to yield. What does 400 bushel corn look like? Well, we're looking at it. It's got some nice size ears. These are at a population of 52,000 plants per acre right here. So that's why we're able to get such a high yield off, especially these smaller ones like this. This is a really nice size ear, but our population's just so high. You get a monster like this at this population, this could be like a 600 bushel per acre yield if all the ears were that size. But we got some smaller ones in here. We also got some ones these, I believe, got attacked by a stink bug, if I'm not mistaken. That basically just turns to a powder. There's absolutely no weight in that. We lost all those kernels that are white there. Got another one down here. This one's got it too. But honestly, nice, nice size here. That's pretty cool. Not a lot of people can say they've raised 400 bushel corn legitimately outside of it just being a blip on the yield monitor, which I guess mine was kind of a blip, but I can make a whole pass across the field doing 330 right now, which not a lot of people can say that either. <laughs> and I mean, this is also kind of the cheating way because it's, the, it's an intercrop. This is not a monocrop situation. It's a whole different animal. If someone was trying to be in a yield contest for monocrop in this situation, they'd probably be raising like, 700 bushel corn. <laughs> hey, 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 look at that. We're on the monocrop stuff. We have one pass of the one and one left, and then we are done with the intercrop corn. Anyway, we still got the beans. There it is for the intercrop corn. That was a little bit of a, a time consuming process. I'm not gonna lie. Remember how I said that I wanted to weigh everything just in case the monitor did something wacky and we didn't have that information? I just got done. We're sitting here, letting everything cool down. And I decided I'm gonna go in and mess with the monitor, change the color mapping a little bit and my intercrop plot, the entire area from the tip of that waterway to the edge of that line completely disappeared as soon as I changed the parameters of the map. Completely gone. Oh, ah, what a sight. <sighs> it's about midnight right now. It takes some mental brain power to do all these calculations. I need to calculate what everything did individually yet, but as a whole for the entire intercrop plot from the 12s all the way down to the 1s 
Everything averaged 313 bushels to the acre. We had it over 22 acres of corn right there. I thought it was 27, I had 27 acres of beans, and I took the end rows off, and I had five acres of end rows. So 22 acres of corn, 313 bushels to the acre. When I get some sleep, I will calculate out these other rows, <laughs> and so we'll know what each one did individually, because I think that's going to be interesting. I can see what it did on the monitor, but it was all lumped together in one. So unless I go in on the app and I circle the area in the field and then it tells me, which would be the much easier thing to do, but I want to use my brain a little bit and do some math and then we'll have it on this wonderful piece of paper. That's incredible. Now we just got to get the beans combined and then we'll be able to add the revenue of the corn plus revenue of the beans. And then we'll be able to compare that to what our bean yields were on the averages of our monocrop beans. And then once we get more corn harvested, we'll be able to compare it to the monocrop corn. And then we'll be able to see where we come in from a revenue perspective to see if this intercrop plot is more profitable than a monocrop situation. Looking at this 313 bushel corn, if these beans do decent, <laughs> it, high likelihood this is a, a quite a profitable method, at least for this year. Dad's gonna run this stuff for just a little while longer. It sounds like Cooper is gonna be sleeping in the dryer shack basically the rest of harvest, so that way he can monitor the dryer every hour or two during the night, and then he can just sleep in there. We have a shower and stuff, so he'll just be able to kind of hang there. This is the result. We ended up averaging 220 bushels on the control, 268 bushels on the rows of 12, 274 bushels on the rows of six. Then we did a little bit worse when we gathered more rows back, 262 on the eights, 306 on the fours, 313 on the threes, 342 on the twos, 385 on the ones. And then our high management control that had an extra passive fungicide on it and a few other micros in with the mix did 19 bushels better than the control. In the center here, I do have how many points it needed to be dried in order to bring it down to 15%, and I did account for that in the weight. So these are all dry bushels right here. That is pretty stinking incredible. We just need to get the soybeans harvested, then we'll be able to put those soybean numbers right beside these. We'll be able to figure out the total revenues per acre, and then we will be able to see which of these is the most profitable and how much more profitable is it than the control. And I need to point out all of these had the exact same management as the control. The only difference was how we planted the rows, the row configuration in the population of the outside rows was changed. But the control, same nitrogen, same fertilizer, same everything as all of these here. The only thing we did different was the high management control. This got extra stuff but otherwise all of these were the exact same. So simply by changing rows, we have a 220 bushel yield all the way up to a 385 bushel. Same fertilizer, same nitrogen, same everything. That is incredible. What makes that 385 so crazy is the fact that if I was in the National Corn Growers Association contest in the no-till non-irrigated category, and we look at the top yields here, whatever you got to do to get number one, look at that. I would have won the entire contest. But this is monocrop here, so these guys are some pretty incredible farmers. But technically speaking, I won the NCGA contest.